And I'm so honored to introduce Dr. Klaus Kepfli from the Smithsonian and George Mason University. I have known Klaus since forever ago when I was a baby. <laughs> 2000 and four. Uh, we did our PhDs together. He's going to be the only one I give this extensive intro to because I've known him so long. But um, without further ado, um, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Klaus Kepfli on the using genomics to inform the management of XC2 insurance populations of threatened species. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> You good to go? I'm good to go. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you, Annabelle, Chris, and Stefan, for organizing this incredible meeting. I've already had a great day and a half. Um, this is just really amazing, and it's been really, I've enjoyed myself really meeting new people and talking with um, many of you as well. So this afternoon, for the next 25 minutes or so, hopefully I don't go over, but... Um, I'll keep track of you. I, okay, good. <laughs> He's, she's good at that. So... Um, um, I'm going to convince you that, you know, this is a, uh, a meeting about small populations. Well, I work with small populations almost exclusively. So you heard Enrique's talk before lunch about black-footed ferrets descending from a very small founder population and, you know, trying to rescue it and using genomics to understand, um, you know, how we can use this information. But I'm going to talk about other examples and where I think this field needs to go. So when I talk about exitu conservation, I'm talking about things that are outside the natural range of species, right? So this includes botanical gardens, aquaria, zoos, and of course, biorepositories and seed banks as well. Okay, so even though these places usually started um, for entertainment or education purposes starting in the 1960s, 70s, um, their mission changed because of the loss of biodiversity, right? So most of these institutions now have um, partly a conservation focus or an entire conservation focus. And so when we talk about, you know, um, I'm going to be focusing on animals, but um, it applies to um, plants and, you know, uh, aquatic organisms as well. But the role of captive or breeding and conservation and conserving species is that, of course, we set up insurance populations to uh, prevent extinction. We, um, you know, grow and sustain the populations to basically manage their demography so there's enough individuals for the population to get going. Um, and then, of course, we focus on maintaining genetic diversity for genetic health and um, adaptive potential if those animals are going to be eventually reintroduced in the wild. So here are just three species, the Bali Minor, the Panamanian Golden Frog, and the Scimitar Horned Oryx that were all became extinct in the wild and were rescued from extinction because of captive or ex situ um, conservation breeding. So these two species have now been reintroduced back into the wild. Um, this species is still threatened by chytrid fungus, so it's in a holding pattern right now in um, facilities um, here in the United States and in Panama until it is safe to reintroduce those species back in the wild. The way we usually manage genetic diversity in these ex situ populations is, um, if we can, depending on, you know, um, the information that we have available, is, you know, through pedigree analysis. So, you know, once we, um, <clears throat> once we, uh, a group of animals uh, is brought into a zoo, for example, we assume that those are unrelated to set up the pedigree. We grow the founders um, to the population size required, which means the space that we have for those, uh, that species, sustain the size of the population as much as possible and keep genetic contributions of the founders as even as possible um, in order to avoid inbreeding. And the main measure that's been used um, for a long time and it's actually, you know, f um, successful is using mean kinship. So just knowing the kinship of every individual of a species within an ex situ program um, to every other individual including itself. So then you basically are taking the most unrelated individuals um, and hopefully that they'll breed together in order to slow the loss of genetic diversity. It's important to remember these are mostly closed populations. So once you set up a founder population, for example, in a zoo, um, it's very rare that you're going to go back in the wild um, to put in more animals. So that becomes a closed population, right? So, so because that, you know, one over genetic uh, diversity decreases every generation by one over 2NE, um, then we have to basically design this program in order to slow the loss of genetic diversity. 
so these ex situ populations, like even populations, uh, small populations in the wild, face a lot more of unique genetic um, challenges. So the number of founders um, can be highly variable. And it's important to remember though, those founders represent possibly a very, very small fraction of the original or remaining genetic diversity that was in the wild population. The relatedness among the founders may be known. It depends on the species. Um, populations may have lost genetic diversity before we brought them into um, an ex situ setting. And uh, as I just mentioned, that populations are usually closed or there's very limited metapopulation management and therefore that increases the possible risk of inbreeding. And of course, since we're protecting these animals and we want to keep them going and population size is um, um, large enough and according to the space that we have, we minimize selection, right? So if you're using mean kinship to decide who gets to mate from whom, there's no sexual selection going on. We take that away and of course, they're in captivity. So they're protected from predators, pathogens, and so on and so forth because that is not going to do very well in an ex situ setting, right? So that can actually change the actual landscape of selection in the genome, depending on how many generations these species are in captivity. So just as an example, so here are three species. Um, you can see vastly different founders. So the, and you know, this is from the AZA, but basically the slender horn oryx. So um, there's 91 here in North America. Um, there's more, of course, across in different zoos across the world, but the entire captive population around the world was only founded by one male and two females. Same thing here with the western tufted deer, um, two, ma two males and two females. Okay, And then <coughs> on the other side of the spectrum, giraffe, very popular animal, um, everyone wants to see them. Um, 94 founders and you know right now within North America, just in zoos, not in other facilities, uh, ex situ facilities, there's 234 samples. Now this species is um, now challenging because um, recently it's been proposed that the giraffe actually represents four distinct species. So now what do we have in captivity and therefore how do we manage what we we have in terms of giraffe resources, because this is a species that is um, on a decline across its range in wild Africa. So it might very well be that these captive populations, because they are such a popular animal with the public, that these populations might actually be eventually and someday um, a source for reintroduction. And I also like to point out that despite the genetic challenges, working with zoo populations, especially where I work at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, is, brings a lot of um, advantages. So samples are relatively accessible and fresh. So I just work with veterinarians who, when they work up with the animals and do a checkup, I can ask for a blood sample just for genomic or transcriptomic analysis. Um, longitudinal sampling design is possible. So for example, a lot of places like the frozen zoo, for example, in San Diego, has the original founders of those slender horned gazelles. So we can then, which were brought into captivity back in the late 1960s. So we can then compare those samples with samples for, for, uh, that are of animals today. The relatedness in population history is often known. And so, um, and what I really like is that, you know, because these are small populations, we can specifically look at things like genetic erosion, drift, inbreeding, um, burden, and uh, mutational load as well. And even more excitingly, like uh, the black footed ferret sample, uh, black footed ferret um, that uh, Enrique talked about. Um, and a lot of other species are like this, like cheetahs and tigers and so on and so forth. Clinical metadata are available for every individual. So black-footed ferrets, for example, um, that captive breeding program started in the mid-1980s. So we have banked biobank samples for all 10,000 samples and we have exactly what the reproductive success of males and females are across the generations since the 1980s. So that's the rare, there's not many, not a lot of species are like that, but again, um, there's other um, features that you can derive from other species. So that makes it possible to do sort of quasi, you know, phenotype, um, a genotype phenotype associations. And of course, the research that we're doing can directly inform um, conservation management. So just as an example, for um, I was part of a team led by um, Emily Humble at the University of Edinburgh where we looked at this extinct in the wild species. Um, it's still classified by the IUCN as extinct in the wild even though a reintroduction program began in 2016. So we just wanted to look at the influence of management, how herds of scimitar horned oryx are managed, you know, whether it's using a pedigree or a pedigree free approach. So here, for example, in um, the uh, in European and 
um, US uh, or North American populations, for example, we use pedigrees. And from these populations in the United Arab Emirates, um, they don't use pedigrees, right? So we wanted to evaluate, for example, what is the, when you use pedigrees or an intensive approach versus a non-intensive approach, what does that do to the genomic profile? So we see, for example, that these Manage, management free approaches have a higher burden of uh, runs of homozygosity and also a higher mutational load as well. So that's the type of studies that you can do in order to understand whether, how management is influencing um, your genetic health of your um, species. So I'm going to spend a little time, the uh, rest of the talk actually on this species um, because it's a species that we've started uh, about uh, four years ago and it's now become um, one of my favorite systems because again Again, when you talk to people, uh, ask them what a dama gazelle is, most people don't know what a they know what a gazelle is, but they don't know what a dama gazelle is. So this is the world's largest gazelle species. It's critically endangered. There's about 2,500 animals left in the world. Very few left in their native range of North Africa, um, and most two thirds of the remaining populations are found in private ranches in Texas. So they're not even in public institutions. So Texas is unusual because it's a state that has the highest level of private land ownership and so there are more than a thousand private exotic game ranches um, and that's where you're going to find most of this population and it's the same thing with the scimitar horned oryx there's about you know this species even though it's extinct in the wild there's about 30,000 scimitar horned oryx um, in the world 20,000 of them are in Texas okay <laughs> So this is the, the former range of this species. So um, three, um, you know, it, it occupied a vast uh, range across the Sahel and Southern Sahara Desert. Um, and you know, it's important to point out that this is, you know, this area is uh, larger than the entire continental United States. So, um, and it's amazing. So this is where the scimitar horned oryx lives as well. This is a very specialized type of habitat that gave rise to some unique ungulates and other, other vertebrates and invertebrates as well. So in terms of what we find in zoos, for example, in Europe, in the United States, and the Middle East, is that we find, you know, the, uh, this is what's called the Adra gazelle, and this is the Mohor gazelle. Okay, so these are the two populations that are activity in, in captivity. So you see that there's this morphological difference in coat color pattern. That's one of the features that distinguishes them or they're considered subspecies. There's a central subspecies as well. So this is the nominant um, subspecies for the species. And um, as far as we know, they're not in captivity. And we think that this subspecies has gone extinct. So. I want to talk about how this species came into North America and these two subspecies. So, Adra gazelles, okay, um, they were brought into North America around 1967 with a you know semi-large um, founder population. Whereas the Mahor gazelle, by the time Mahor gazelles were brought in captivity, only five animals were left in the world. Okay, so one male and four females, and it was a Spanish naturalist who thought that you know the last population was in a uh, uh, garrison, an uh, army garrison in Western Sahara. And he thought, a Spanish naturalist came along and thought, well, you know, if we let this species, this subspecies here, it'll go extinct. So they brought them to um, a preserve in southern Spain, which created a very successful captive breeding program and prevented the Mohor gazelle from going extinct. Now, given this different founder and population history and so on, we can make predictions about, you know, the genetic um, profile of, this, of, of these populations in captivity. So with regards to genetic diversity, inbreeding, mass load, and realized load, okay? So, and when we manage these species in captivity, this is usually what you see. So every two or three years, um, the species survival plan. So this is a group of individuals and population biologists that basically assess how the population is doing in captivity. And they create what's called a breeding and transfer plan. And this is the basically the plan that decides which male gets to mate with which female and vice versa, okay? And so usually each these plans have what are called executive summaries about the demography. So this is from 2020 and the genetics, okay? So in 2020 in North America, the population size was 122 with 41 uh, males and 81 females, 
Okay. Now, the genetics part is the most interesting to me, of course. Um, so, you know, we assume that, you know, even though I said there are 20 to 23 founders, um, the North American Adra Gazelle population, and this is just for Adra Gazelles, um, was founded, considered based on the pedigree from 13 individuals. But the founder genome equivalents, so that's the number of individuals that have the genetic diversity that you find in the population today based on how many founders are assumed there, is much, much lower, right? Because this is a polygynous breeding species, right? So inbreeding is, is fairly high, and then you can also calculate things like, you know, um, effective population size and sensitive population, the, the, the ratio of, of effective to census um, size. And of course, you know, there's recommendations. So the population biologists who are trained in genetics and um, population genetics in order to understand how we can best retain re genetic diversity, you know, make recommendations on how to basically um, either maintain or increase the genetic diversity over time. So we wanted to explore um, the genomics of this species um, from a, you know, um, to get to get an understanding of the of the profile um, based on the expectations that we had, so we generated a reference genome for an Adra gazelle, and then we resequenced a handful of, of individuals from each subspecies to perform these various types of analyses. So just like Enrique was showing with the black-footed ferret, we can create these SNV density plots as uh, just a heat map. So we just a sliding window analysis of one megabase that we slide along these chromosome level assemblies that. Um, we can just ask, you know, how many SNPs in this window and so on. It's a very straightforward way to visualize the, the, the genome, so the variation in the genome. So, you know, hotter is more diverse, cooler is less diverse. So this is what an Adra gazelle looks like. And then you can see in a Mohor gazelle. So we'd expect, because this is such a small founder population and went through a bottleneck before it was even brought into captivity, that it would be expected to have lower heteros, uh, lower diversity. So here, what's interesting too about this species is that there's a um, um, autosomal to sex chromosome um, translocation. So this is actually part of the um, X chromosome here that's been translocated onto um, chromosome 15. Um, and so that translocation has basically fixed a whole block of variation, very high variation in this genome. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. In terms of ROH profile, so not surprisingly, when we look across three different classes, size classes of ROH, the Mahor gazelles have a higher uh, burden of ROH compared to the Adra gazelles. And then, of course, we can look at um, mutational load. So, again, you know, when we compare, for example, heterozygous um, variants, and you know, so this is the masked um, load, and then um, the realized load, the alternative homozygous with respect to the reference, we see, for example, that these. Um, um, Mahor gazelles have a higher burden of missense mutations, and even though because of the scale of the other types of variants that, you know, there's about a uh, little less than a thousand um, highly deleterious or loss of function variants um, here in the Mahor gazelle relative to the Adra gazelle. So just what we'd expect, right, from population genetic theory, right, for a small population. So just like with um, black-footed ferrets, um, you know, we focus on reproductive um, aspects because my colleagues at the Smithsonian are reproductive physiologists. And they're the ones who've been collecting data and with colleagues in Europe as well to examine for, um, the relationship of genetic diversity with regards to, for example, male fertility as measured by sperm motility and percentage of abnormal sperm. So here, um, back in 2012, Ruiz Lopez from the Preserve in Spain looked at Adra gazelles and Mahor gazelles and other gazelle species and found, again, this relationship that the lower the heterozygosity, the lower the percentage of normal sperm that you had. So we took our, we, we took our um, deleterious variant data set and just looked for genes that are enriched, um, you know, um, and are associated with uh, male, um, male infertility. So here's just an example. So here's an example. We found a lot of these um, genes with deleterious variants are often heterozygous in the Adra gazelles, but they're fixed or homozygous in the um, uh, Mahor gazelle. So here's a um, frame shift mutation that we find, for example, um, just showing you just, you know, one Adra gazelle and Mahor gazelle to keep it simple. But um, we find this at, you know, fixed frequencies in the Mahor gazelle. So here's this uh, insertion that uh, disrupts the um, reading frame of this protein that you know, at least in humans and I think in cattle as well, has been linked um, to various 
um, abnormalities or physiological abnormalities, including male fertility. So what people have suggested um, um, is that, you know, given the conditions of the genetic conditions and also what we know about how easy it is to breed or not um, these two gazelle subspecies, because, for example, Mahor gazelles, when they were brought into captivity for many decades, their neonate mortality was two to three times higher than the Adra gazelle. So when ranchers um, in North America, there, I went to a ranch in North America that had both subspecies. The rancher told me Adra gazelles have no problems whatsoever. And there's never a death that you see among the neonates, whereas this one, there's often problems. So the idea that had been proposed, and also using based on some genetic evidence, because there was um, a mitochondrial DNA study by a colleague of mine at, in Scotland showed that there was no reciprocal monophyly of mitochondrial haplotypes among these subspecies. So the idea was to um, perhaps breed um, these two subspecies together in order to genetically rescue you know, this subspecies and blend them, of course. But there's a lot of controversy, of course, because and a lot of people who don't want this done, especially um, people who've been managing these species for a long time. They're phenotypically different. Um, you know, there's a concern over the loss of the integrity of possible if these are considered evolutionary significant units, and there was a concern about outbreeding depression. Well, based on the mitochondrial study that was done, um, a experimental population at the Alien Zoo in the UAE was set up to basically create reciprocal um, matings between, you know, Mahor gazelles and Adra gazelles. So like a male Mahor and a female Adra and a female Mahor and a male Adra. Um, and just see what would happen. Okay, so, um, and this has gone now to um, F6. I think they've now stopped this breeding population. But the results were very promising. So, you know, first of all, these crosses were fertile. Um, the neonate mortality, especially re in relation to the pure Mahor gazelles, decreased. And, you know, by all intents and purposes, the offspring or these mixed offspring are, you know, behaving and um, look like uh, Dama gazelles, even though they appear to similar to basically appear similar to that central subspecies, actually. So, so we wanted to investigate that with our genome data. And when we look at, for example, the differences between, you know, between individuals of the same subspecies and individuals of different subspecies, you know, it's not that much different. So um, we collaborated with James Cahill, who's now at the University of uh, Florida, to um, implement his hybrid PSMC, which allows you to estimate, for example, um, when gene flow um, ceased between um, these two lineages. And so we have an estimate of around 65,000 years ago and when we do some um, resampling modeling and so on um, you know it ranges somewhere between 65,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago so that tells us that these two subspecies even though that they were widely separated you know when their populations decline declined uh, in the past they were still relatively closely related and then we also looked at the um, chromosome so um, because um, the Mahor gazelle um, captive population was started at the San Diego Zoo um, back in 1980. And every animal that goes through the San Diego Zoo at that time was karyotyped. So they have this wonderful catalog of karyotypes from a lot of their species, especially the ungulates. And so we knew, for example, that these Species, these subspecies differ um, in terms of chromosome numbers. So we call those cytotypes in terms of, you know, whether you have a diploid number of 38, 39, or 40, which are the three common cytotypes found within this species. Chromosomal, within species, or intraspecific chromosomal polymorphism is a very common feature in gazelles. We don't quite understand why, but it is. And it's often um, associated with a autosomal to sex chromosome um, translocation or vice versa. So we just wanted to see whether these cytotypes have any association with with um, subspecies, and they don't, okay? Um, so they had a smaller number of Adra gazelles, but it still told us that there was no distinctness between it. You, you know, don't, uh, the, the difference is just because of the smaller number of Adra gazelles compared to the Mahor gazelles, because the Mahor gazelle captive breeding populations was focused at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And so because San Diego Zoo had the pedigree of these, we could just map those cytotypes across the pedigree of the Mahor gazelles. And, you know, um, this is where the karyotyping started. And you can just see here, here are two um, um, 30N, 39s, um, 2N39 cytotype um, individuals, a male and female, giving rise to 
all three types of chromosomal polymorphisms, okay? So, yeah. So, where do I come down on whether we should mix these or not? Well, from a genomic perspective, they're not that different. We don't think that outbreeding um, depression, as the experimental population has showed us, might be a problem. Um, but the the people in Spain um, who have basically focused um, a lot of the efforts on keeping the Mohor gazelle um, subspecies going, using their pedigree records, they recently published a study showing that the neonate mortali mortality is now um, actually improved dramatically um, since the founding of this population. So maybe the things that you know were affecting neonate mortality, which is you know again a very complex fitness trait, um, you know has. Purge. So, but because they have samples in Spain of those original founders up until today, we can do a longitudinal study like that. So that's something that's in the works. So, and you know, I just wanted to point out that there's this um, idea now um, that's you know was started. Um, a while ago, but formalized by people like Kathy Rawls and her colleagues, and most recently, just within the last month, Dave Powell um, from the St. Louis Zoo, about you know whether we really should be worrying so much about you know maintaining you know subspecies or evolutionary significant units, especially in captivity, because someone like Dave Powell would argue that you know if there's only 2,500. Um, Dama gazelles left in the world, is it really that important to um, keep Adra gazelles and Mahor gazelles? Do we still, but instead of just wanting having uh, to have um, Dama gazelles in the world, um, given that they have such low numbers? So this is an ongoing debate that's going on in both you know the wild literature and um, captive literature. So we can also do something very innovative because there's all these dama gazelles, especially adra gazelles, in ranches in Texas. We can actually start using genomics to make recommendations of who to breed with whom, or how to basically set up a meta population modeling program. So um, the Smithsonian, as well as other zoological facilities that have animals like dama gazelles, partnered with ranches that are dedicated to conservation, not so much trophy hunting, because most of those ranches are for trophy hunting. Um, but so the idea was that, you know, use genomic data combined with population modeling to um, basically design a metapopulation management program that you know, incorporates urban zoos, because which have very little space, breeding centers that have more space, and then ranches that often have very large space. So in some of these Texas ranches, for example, you can go um, and, you know, a rancher might have a herd of 100 dama gazelles on his property. Th that would be the highest number that's anywhere in the world, somewhere in Texas. And where these animals can basically start behaving like they would in the wild, because this is, these are herding species. So um, a postdoc, very brilliant postdoc of ours, um, Rebecca Gooley, led this effort. So this is based on RADSEQ data, where we just genotyped um, almost 100 dama gazelles. And we did this in comparison with um, um, sable antelope as well. And we just used um, relatedness, um, you, according to mean kinship and genetic distance, to basically see what would happen if you didn't have a metapopulation program versus transplanting two, four, or six, or more males among ranches and zoos. And we use the genetic distance and the mean kinship to basically assign which individuals um, are overrepresented in a particular, you know, from a genetic profile. And those would be the ones that would be the highest ranked in terms of transplanting. So then running this through a model like Vortex just allows us to show, so here, for example, using, you know, from this ranch, Okay, if you left this ranch by itself and didn't import any animals, this is how much genetic diversity or how much genetic diversity would climb over the next hundred years. Um, and this is how you slow that uh, diversity by, you know, the higher the number of males that you're basically translocating to this ranch, the slower the rate of the genetic decline occurs. So again, this like has direct implications for the management of this. And instead of a pedigree, pedigrees are fantastic. Don't get me wrong, um, but they don't tell you a lot in terms of like the details of what's going on in the genome, of course. So um, by having empirically founded recommendations based on genomic data, then you know, can do um, studies like this. So I'm just going to end my talk. I guess got a few more minutes left, but a um, couple minutes left, so I'm going to be fast. Um, so um, I think Jana Wolt. 
is going to talk after me, and um, I met Jana through her PhD advisor, um, uh, Dr. Tammy Stevens at the University of Canterbury, because I got involved in this other source of variation, structural variation. Okay, so you know most of our meeting has been on um, SNPs, and that's great, but can SNPs are not the only type of variation that are found in genomes, and I think it's really important that we start interrogating that type of variation. Um, and now, given the um, lower cost of long, se long read sequencing technologies and so on, and with the development of things like the um, Human Pan Genome Consortium, I think that's going to be possible within the coming years. So what we did um, at the time, what I did at the time, is that I was just interested in seeing, again, fleshing out this difference between Adras and Mahor gazelles, and we used an optical mapping approach. So we used the BioNano um, Sapphire, and I partnered with uh, BioNano to do this analysis. So I initially sent them, you know, one individual of each subspecies. We've now ex expanded that data set um, to uh, more individuals. So now we have a total of 14 individuals, so seven and seven. Um, and yes, you know, this is one of the first things that we saw that you know there was quite a number of differences between these subspecies okay and so here's just an example so here's a complex um, structural variant you know so here is um, gazelle one is the um, adra gazelle so that's our reference assembly and then gazelle two is a mahor gazelle so here just within this small stretch of the genome um, you know we see deletions as well as a tandem duplication um, and again when we look at this across multiple individuals these are fixed structural variants we're just focusing right now on the fixed ones we also see uh, vi structural variation differences between individuals individuals as well. So, um, and so this is exciting work um, because we're now we're, you know, using our annotation, we're figuring out which genes are included in these structural variants, what they could mean and so on. And just like you can do uh, with SNPs, you can assess the mutational load or the effect, you know, using SIFT-like tools to uh, evaluate the functional impact of these structural variants. And then lastly, you know, we've been talking, a lot of talks have been mentioning about deleterious variants, mutational load, and so on. And I think um, for us, I mean, you know, doing the population level evaluation of load, realize the mass load is really important. But I'm a type of person who's like, I really want to understand and get down in the details. I'm sure many of you are the same. So just last year, I started collaborating with a team of um, researchers who um, helped develop um, machine learning models to basically predict and rank the pathogenicity of deleterious variants. So, you know, you do something like SNP effects or VEP and you get a whole set of deleterious variants. You can do a gene enrichment analysis if you have enough genes, do network analysis to understand what pathways are affected. But I want to understand from a conservation, especially ex situ perspective, which variant should we care the most about? So these type of um, models, so this is from you know, the parent company of Facebook, they developed a model um, for both protein folding and mutant variant prediction called evolutionary scale modeling. And the, for the model is um, ESM-1V. Um, so the idea here is that, for example, here is a amino acid sequence right here, and here are all the possible different types of substitutions you know, at this particular position. So given the context of the surrounding amino acid, you can then evaluate, for example, if there is a, um, you know, an alanine change to you know something else here, a histidine change. You can evaluate how pathogenic, okay, or how non-pathogenic or deleterious, I should say, um, that variant might be, and especially if it focuses on an, um, a, you know, uh, this is for missense mutations. You can do these sort of same models are being developed now for loss of function mutations as well. But what ESM is unusual and exciting. Um, uh, is is that you know compared to other models that do this sort of thing where you usually have it you know you have a, a multiple sequence alignment database and so you know you're looking at conservation scores and other features here um, ES, ESM-1V is a what's called a zero shot predictor it doesn't um, take any information except the protein sequences themselves so <laughs> okay. 
great, almost last slide. So yeah, yeah. So so this is just another way to basically, you know, what we're interested in doing is ranking the pathogenicity of deleterious variants. And then that way we don't necessarily need to sequence entire genomes. We can actually design SNP targeted SNP panels in order to just assess, you know, whether these are homozygous, heterozygous, um, or even present in, you know, the individuals we care about. So we're doing this with the black-footed ferret data and the um, Dama gazelle data because you can do this using a single genome or a population of genomes, which I think is more powerful. But we've already gotten some really exciting results just looking at the missense variation landscape and have, you know, in the Dama gazelles we have five very strong candidates. So, so again, you're doing predictions based on, you know, what the variant is and the context of that, you know, mutation and its amino acid substitution um, change in the context of the neighboring protein sequence, given the entire universe of the proteome. Yeah, so ESM-1V has like 500 million parameters, and I think the next version will be more than a billion parameters that can all be done. And the efficiency of this modeling is incredible because, again, you'll need a server to do this, but, you know, with a black-footed ferret data set, it took uh, about three days to run. So. Okay, yes, yeah, so I just want to thank my terrific team of collaborators. The um, Dom Excel project was led by a um, former postdoc of mine, Pavel Dubrinin, um, and you know the wonderful team I get to work with um, at, the, at the Smithsonian, as well as um, various uh, universities and other uh, institutions who helped create these genome resources. So thank you. Limited to one question, and Excellent. I'd really like to encourage um, students and postdocs to be that one question. So I still see the hand up, <laughs> and then we can talk to class later. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, that and uh, talk and uh, asking some of the very important philosophical questions yeah. about genetic rescue. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the the sort of the hybrid uh, subspecies models uh, mm -hmm. that you see survive in captivity. But if you were to actually take them in the wild, where the fitness landscape is going to be very different. Uh, would you expect them to survive? I assume you can have a high number of these, but would you still expect them to survive even if yeah. you have a high number? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's really, you know, very species specific and so on. Um, because, so from the perspective, like the idea of like you having, uh, you're releasing animals that have higher genetic variation, even though you might have mixed them. I mean, it's an experiment that you have to do, right? So, so far, like the that experimental population in the UAE, they're doing just fine. No, nobody's dying prematurely or anything like that. They're all actually doing, you know, in some ways, at least with, again, with respect to the Mahor gazelles, they're doing very, very well. Now, that was po that's an experimental population. Those animals are just going to basically live out their lives there in the UAE. But again, you know, it was great that we had enough animals in order to even do that experiment, right? And sort of do an understanding whether that, whether, you know, they would release those animals, that's going to be, you know, again, that'll have to undergo a debate. So, but our idea is that, you know, with a, for example, with the, the, the scimitar horned oryx, it's extinct in the wild species. So as far as we know, they didn't have any subspecies or anything like that. But we released, you know, very, um, the most genetically diverse animals um, back into the wild. So I got the, I got the message, so. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Oh, thank you.